Right, uh, thank you and uh, a very good morning everybody. Uh, my PhD was on John Howard and I, it took me seven years to complete it and I interviewed 85 people and uh, Mr Howard was uh, very generous with his time also. We examined his personal communication and the style of his communication, particularly in a crisis, the changing impact of technologies and the Prime Minister's uh, office coordination of communication within government and across uh, again, the wider community. So it was a fascinating study indeed. So today's presentation will focus on um, John Howard's personal communication style, the Prime Minister's statements on some critical crisis he faced, and also the legacies of the Howard government decisions. So his approach to communication, uh, this was a quote, it's a great quote, Howard immersed himself in waves of media coverage that daily flooded the airwaves. And again, Paul Kelly, who was here yesterday, Howard operates in a 24-hour media cycle for the 1,000 days of each three-year term. And so and we know how uh, committed he was on his walks in the morning. He'd have the ABC, AM on and so forth. Uh, Costello said that Howard's one-person focus group was, in fact, his wife, Jeanette. So uh, I don't know whether that's true, John, but it's a very interesting uh, comment to make because yeah, I think you talk to her frequently, uh, almost every day, and uh, that's a very interesting observation that, uh, that, that, <laughs> that, that he might. He might. <laughs> uh, Mark Butler, uh, or Baker rather, said to me, he used the same quotes today he used 15 years ago. And so there's that consistency of messaging. Now, Ken Henry, very interesting comments here. Policy recommendations. He said that John Howard viewed with a balance of what made sense in policy terms and would I ever be able to explain it to people? And Henry said to me he would present a policy to John and uh, he would say, Ken, great, great policy. But he said, I can't sell it. Go back and rework it. And so this was quite interesting. And this is what... Uh, uh, John Howard said about the development of policies. I always thought you could sell a big reform. We got... Okay, well, it's plugged in, so let's see whether we can try this again. Hang on. I always thought you could sell a big reform, provided you could satisfy people on two things. Firstly, it was good for Australia. And secondly, it was fundamentally fair to the more vulnerable in the community. Yeah, so interesting observations. Now, in interviewing, uh, again, the, the front bench and so forth of uh, the John Howard um, uh, cabinet, they always said he was persuasive and exuded confidence. He used communication skills to clearly explain issues. And we saw this many, many times when he was doing media interviews. He was a man you could trust and rely upon he navigated through a minefield of issues and did this, again, very calmly. Now, Howard's approach, the facts, experience, 22 years in Parliament prior to becoming the Prime Minister, a confident and reassuring communicator, a strong and guiding hand. And we heard yesterday about the qualities of good leadership, and they are certainly the attributes that John Howard exhibited as Prime Minister. Let's have a look and see some of the statements that were made by Prime Ministers just moving into an election. And you'll remember some of these great quotes. Uh, this was uh, firstly from the insiders. Let's have a look at this. By 1990, no Australian child will be living in poverty. These tax cuts will be delivered in full this financial year. They will be LAW law. There's no way that uh, GST will ever be part of our policy. Never, ever. Never, ever. It's dead. It was killed by the voters in the last election. The greatest moral and economic challenge we will face in the 21st century is climate change. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. So all those memories flood back, don't they, really? But let's have a look and see what the Prime Minister said in more recent times. Uh, no cuts to education, no cuts to health, no change to pensions, no change to the GST, and no cuts to the ABC or SBS. There is continuity and there is change. There is continuity and there is change. So that's why I keep on saying, um, and it's true, there's never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. You know, I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit in yeah. the control room. Jenny said to me, you have to think about this as a father. 
first. You know, it's not a race, it's not a competition. That's not my job. That's not my job. It's not my job to do that. Creating opportunity, rewarding hard work, holding no one back, leaving no one behind. So there are, on many occasions, those particular grabs reflect again the policies which might have emerged, but also some of the defining moments in a, a Prime Minister's uh, history. So the changing media environment, um, you could probably have Howard as the first multimedia Prime Minister that we had, and that was George Megalogenis. Uh, the election campaign in 2007 was described as the YouTube election. Now this is very challenging, as, uh, and again, Mr Howard was in office as uh, these technologies start to emer emerge. In fact, he was uh, courageous enough to launch uh, his climate policy on YouTube, one of the very first to do so. Good morning. Australian action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions since 1990, led by my government. It's unusual these days to say good morning on any social media platform, but there you go. But it was a very courageous effort, and I think, again, you embraced that, uh, again, in the end, near the end of your term. So crisis incidents. Now, we heard about the, the gun crisis uh, yesterday as well. It emerged just six weeks after uh, John Howard became Prime Minister. Now, this was uh, very interesting. And you see the photograph up there with the, the bulletproof vest. And when I was talking to, uh, to John through my thesis, he made some comments about why he actually wore this. And he did this also in a television interview. Let's have a listen. That's why I did that, because... The Commonwealth Police told me they, the local police had spoken to somebody who'd rung up or wanted into the local police station and said, I'm going to shoot the so-and-so. I, I, I foolishly, in my view, it's my responsibility, nobody else's, I, I wore it and I felt afterwards I shouldn't have. Did you feel stupid? I did feel quite stupid, and it was stupid, because I never actually felt frightened. It just was the wrong signal. So, again, thinking about the communication about, again, that political antenna uh, that uh, John Howard had. Now, gun deaths did go down in Australia um, after that, and, of course, after, um, again, the Port Arthur uh, massacre. And, of course, the United States, and they've often reflected and looked to Australia, you know, can the US learn from Australian gun reform? Well, they obviously haven't, but it's quite interesting, the observations that were made when uh, John Howard was interviewed by a... Uh, USA Television Network in 2016. John Howard has spoken out on American television to defend the tough gun controls he brought in following the Port Arthur massacre. I mean, if he had 13 mass shootings before Port Arthur and he had none since, isn't that evidence? And if he had a 74% fall in the gun-related suicide rate, isn't that evidence? Were we expected to believe that that was all magically going to happen? Come on. <laughs> so, yeah, come on. Come on. Yeah. Get real. <laughs> oh, indeed. Now, again, we heard about the, the war on the waterfront uh, yesterday as well, that, uh, that crisis situation, and, of course, on East Timor also. So they've been discussed at uh, this forum. But it was interesting about 9-11 and about the tightening of security. And this is a, a legacy which, again, is still in place uh, today. And, of course, uh, uh, John was in Washington at the time. When it happened, it was so unexpected and was so audacious. A lot of us thought, well, is the next attack going to occur in America or is it going to be London? Is it going to be Tokyo? Is it going to be Sydney? Decisions to introduce security on flights, a crackdown on baggage checks and strengthening aircraft cockpits. And before long, Howard promised Australia's assistance in the war on terror. It was a difficult decision because it involved putting the lives of young soldiers on the line. The and so we see again the, the tightening of security. That was the beginning, and of course we're now living with it. And of course the, uh, the Tampa crisis in 2001. Now this was uh, greatly reflected on just recently, and it has been... Uh, over many, many years uh, since this occurred. Yeah, Prime Minister Howard also sent troops on board the Tampa, a Norwegian tanker that was in waters off Christmas Island, carrying rescued asylum seekers, but Australia refused to let them ashore. Could you have predicted that those decisions would impact or lay the foundation, lay the groundwork for Australia's refugee policy for the next 
20 years. You have to do with the immediate challenge. Uh, and I didn't imagine for a moment that a future government would unravel the policy that we had successfully implemented. And of course then came the Pacific uh, solution. The government later enforcing the Pacific solution, offshore processing and expansion of the migration zone and turning back boats. The decisions made 20 years ago setting Australia on a new strategic path, one that we are still following to this day. Which highlights again the legacy of uh, the courage that the, uh, the Howard government had in many of these areas. And of course we talked about the Northern Territory intervention yesterday as well. Uh, and of course that is still still the subject of a great deal of controversy, but also driven, if you like, by governments trying to solve some of the issues which were identified back in 2007. Now, with policy reform, the GST legislation passed on the 28th of June 1999, and you might recall in uh, October 2015, Malcolm Turbill had a great idea. He said, let's look at the GST, everything is on the table. And you might have realised very soon after, everything was off the table. And again, Ken Henry made a very interesting observation about how you need to deal with these major, major policy changes. This is what he said. Uh, as the Howard and Costello government demonstrated with the GST, there needs to be 12 to 18 months spent in preparing the ground for the tax reform package, in genuine education of, or at least, consultation with the Australian community and all sectors of the Australian community. That hasn't happened. And we're going to need at least that for this tax reform package. And it's an in a very interesting commentary that Ken had about that these things take time. And you can't rush things through. You need to take the people with you. And in my PhD, we reflect on how John Howard made this comment to me on many, many occasions, uh, which is why he enjoyed, again, talkback radio and, again, debating, if you like, in those, in those particular areas. So, the Dokovix, we jumped to 2022. Now, how would you describe, you know, the Dokovic saga, we call it, which is polite, but I'm wondering what John Howard would have done in this situation. But let's have a look and just see, um, again, the comments that uh, Scott Morrison made. Rules are rules. And there are no special cases. Actually, there have been dozens of exemptions for celebrities and sports stars. But let's not let the facts complicate the issue. People get on that plane. Um, that is not an assurance that they'll be able to come through Australia's border at the other side. Don't forget, that's because... We will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. That clip must be the most, <laughs> the most seen clip. I think it's been played time and time again. But what a great line. And I think, uh, John, you said to me, that came to you, didn't it? At the time, it was, wasn't focus grouped uh, or researched in any manner, but it has remained now in the psyche of, of Australian and in Australian politics. But you must admit, the Dokovic crisis was a complete stuffer. It, it was a total mess. I mean, he, he got exempted to come here and compete. When he got here, his visa was revoked and it was reinstated again. He won a legal battle to stay in the country. The minister then cancelled his visa. Dokovic then appealed. He lost the appeal and was deported. I mean, it was a shocking, you know, week or two weeks. But there again, it was interesting that they, they quoted the Howard government's policies on how this should have been handled. And I'm sure that had uh, Prime Minister Howard been in power, there may have been uh, not the situation which arose and certainly embarrassed Australia uh, quite significantly. Now, the other thing that really annoys you is these gotcha moments, you know, politically. And these have been going on for a long, long time. And you would have heard, of course... Uh, Sadly, uh, now Prime Minister Albanese is uh, forgetting the unemployment rate. But uh, this is what uh, our former Prime Minister, John Howard, had to say. But the opposition leader had at least received some support yesterday from a perhaps unexpected quarter. Is that a serious question? Yeah, as in the Albanese, you know the unemployment rate. Yeah, well, uh, well, well, I'm not, you know, OK, well, as in the Albanese, you didn't know the unemployment, all right. So what? A series of stumbles today stalled opposition leader John Howard's campaign. Once your family income is over $70,000 a year, you do not get the benefit of the increase in the tax threshold. But that's not what the newspapers were saying this morning. In the footage of the interview, the hand of Howard's press secretary can be seen slipping him the details of his own policy. 
Uh, I bet you're going to give the fellow who found that press clipping a rise, eh? Well, he's a, he's, he's a very good worker. And he didn't even know the policies himself, and I don't know how he expects anyone else to know them if he doesn't. So, these gotcha moments were even in place in the debate in 1996. Let's have a look at this. Do you know what the price of a loaf of bread is? Would you, do you know what a litre yes, of milk... Yes, d- a dollar eighty is a, a, dollar a, a loaf of bread. What's, a, what's, what's a litre of milk cost? About a dollar thirty. Dollar. No, a dollar seven when I last bought it. <laughs> dollar twenty. What about a pair of school shoes? I haven't bought them recently. Do you even know the, the cost of a pint of milk? And uh, about 80p or something like that? No, it's about 40-something p. I don't know the, the, how much a pint of milk costs. They say what? So there you go. These gotcha moments. Unbelievable. And then, of course, uh, Albanese came out and said he'd like to be like a Howard or a Hawk, which was uh, a quite an interesting statement to make. I'll be more like a Hawk or a Howard. Albanese. The opposition leader will say that he is seeking to reform the economy in the same fashion as former Liberal Prime Minister John Howard and Labor Prime Minister Bob Hawke. And you can see the quote there, Howard to elbow, don't try to ride on my coattails. But it's interesting how even Albanese reflected back on on how John Howard as a Prime Minister uh, was outstanding. So as far as media is concerned, the Prime Minister, John Howard, conducted 2,657 media appearances over his term as Prime Minister, and that's from the Liberal Liberal Party official website. And he was interviewed 42 times by Kerry O'Brien. Now, this is quite interesting because O'Brien, as you know, a very entertaining interviewer and did a lot of research. When I talked to O'Brien, I said to him, do you know that uh, John Howard used to practice before he went on the 7.30. And he said, you've got to be kidding. And I said, well, who wouldn't, Kerry? I mean, you don't ask people, how's your day been? Uh, But I think, uh, again, uh, John Howard, very, very committed to making sure there were no mistakes. So he would would prepare thoroughly uh, before interviews of that status. But let's have a look at one very quickly to show you the skill that John Howard exhibited. What an extraordinary Mm -hmm. omission it was when you were taking soundings from your most senior colleagues not to take oh. soundings from Mr Costello as a part of that. Well, well, look, uh, Kerry, he wasn't at the meeting, neither was I. And, look, this is all trivia, frankly. It really is trivia. I don't think your viewers are very interested in... They, okay. They're interested in what I've got to offer them in the future, not, not anything else. I mean, this is the, aren't they the interested in making trivia evaluation, I know that... It, aren't they interested in making evaluations about whether you are genuinely a team or whether privately you dislike each other intensely? Look, we're like any other group of... Of, of politicians. Uh, we have uh, able men and women, uh, all with ambition, uh, but we have been remarkably united over 11 and a half years. I mean, I look at Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. Uh, 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 Peter Costello and I have uh, behaved uh, uh, in a totally gentlemanly fashion towards each other compared to those two. I mean, give us a break. <laughs> 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 Come on! <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just playing with those images, Mr. Howard. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you... Mm. So anyway, there we go. There we go. Um, very, very interesting. So what have prime ministers learnt again from John Howard? Many prime ministers have used talkback radio extensively, and John Howard's strategy for media was certainly using talkback, and he used it extensively and again very, very effectively. I think the other thing is possessing a political antenna. And how many Prime Ministers since John Howard have we seen who don't seem to have one? I mean, it's very, very interesting. And this is one of the things to think about, about the fact that you have to have the skills to do this. And again, the importance of media management, very, very critical in in situations where you're faced daily with uh, enormous challenges. So I'm going to wrap up with just a couple of very quick things. Would National Cabinet, do you think, now have been more effective under Howard's leadership? Would the response to COVID have been different? Would China-Australia relations remained strong? Would we have a trillion dollars in debt? They're very interesting things just to think about. And so I'm going to expand on this, of course, in the the chapter we'll write following uh, this particular forum. And let's have a very quick look at how Prime Minister's... They used to be portrayed like this. Um, We... (laughs) We, we have moved on, uh, fortunately, to this. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. Now, we, we, of course, we saw this, this interesting headline and how surprised uh, Mr Howard was 
uh, reading his bank balance by the look of it there. Um, and again, they, they portray prime ministers in various uh, guises. So this was a, a very unusual shot, I think, of uh, Prime Minister Gillard at the time. Uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, on a on a, on a <laughs> with his friends. I'll do the tokes uh, jokes, Tom. Okay. Um, all right. So and again, you get this uh, sort of. <laughs> Mm. So it's, 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 it's very, very challenging, isn't it? Uh, that was probably one of the other <laughs> major embarrassments, I think, of the campaign. Um, again, very prime ministerial, um, uh, Malcolm Turnbull. Um, again, that's a, a great shot. It appears you've got a lot of credibility if you sit on a couch. Uh, oh, perhaps not, <laughs> perhaps not so much, yeah, perhaps... Uh, not so much. And of course, there's the, the bulldozer, sadly, uh, grappling with that poor child just before uh, this election. And I think this one also pretty well takes the cake. <laughs> yeah. So there we go. And again, he looks like an ASIO agent, but we'll see how uh, they portray, again, Prime Minister Albanese in the years ahead. Um, let's see what the future brings. Thank you very much.